Uh, thanks very much. Uh, I'm Stuart Lee. I was ill last year and for the preceding 36 years. Um, I had to go into hospital. I had this thing called uh, diverticulitis. It's where your stomach kind of starts to poison you. Um, normally, only very old people get it, but if you've been a stand-up comedian for 37 years, drinking heavily and eating mainly Ginster's pies in the night, um, <laughs> that can kind of move it on. So, I had to go into hospital, and while I was in there in, in North London, I had uh, an endoscopy, right? That's where they insert a camera on a fiber optic tube into your anus. Now, on that occasion, it was my anus. <laughs> But it would be your anus, if it were you, that were undergoing the endoscopy. Because uh, in medical science as a rule, there's a direct relationship between who's the subject of the procedure and the information the doctors are trying to find out. That's why you can't send a friend along instead. Even if they really love investigative surgery. <laughs> it has to be you. Anything else is a frivolous waste of time. So, I was in there, I was lying on a slab, and I was naked, except for one of those kind of third-length floral print hospital gowns that go down to about there. Now, I've never understood the design of them. Because as a man, I'm not ashamed of my breasts. <laughs> What I want concealed are my genitals, my penis, my two testicles. They're, they're the source of my shame. <laughs> but the design of the third length floral print hospital gown makes it look as if I've chosen to expose them. <laughs> in a coquettish fashion. which I would never do. I wouldn't do that. So I was being wheeled into the endoscopy and I was lying on a slab. I was naked, uh, third length floor print hospital gown, and I had a fiber optic tube inserted into my lubricated anus. Uh, and then suddenly out of nowhere, this is true, the doctor said to me, oh, I see from your notes that you are a famous comedian. <laughs> and I said to him, there's a problem with that sentence, isn't there, Doctor? Which is that if the phrase, you are a famous comedian, is preceded by the qualifying phrase, I see from your notes, <laughs> then I'm not, I'm not anyway. And then the nurse interrupted rather aggressively. She went, well, I've never heard of you. <laughs> As if it were I that had arrogantly introduced this... vain and boastful notion into the endoscopic procedure, which I hadn't done. I said, well, I am a comedian. And she said, well, you don't look like a comedian. And I said, why? And she said, a comedian should look funny. Now, at the time... <laughs> I was lying on a slab in a third-length floral print hospital gown with a fibre-optic tube inserted into my anus. If I'd seen that... I might have laughed. But I suppose if you work in endoscopy, you run the risk of becoming jaded. <laughs> so I said to her, what do you mean a comedian should look funny? And she said to me, a comedian, she said, should be the sort of person, she said, that as soon as you look at them, she said, it makes you want to laugh, she said, like Joe Pasquale. <laughs> So as I lay there, naked, in a third-length floor print hospital gown, 
with a fiber optic tube inserted into my anus, looking at live video footage relay of my own bleeding and rotting internal organs. <laughs> I thought about Joe Pasquale. <laughs> and I've thought about Joe Pasquale once before in my life, and it was 10 years ago, right? And this is how it happened, okay? When I started doing comedy about 20 years ago, there used to be a comedian on the circuit in London called Michael Redmond. He was Irish. Uh, he, lives in, uh, he lives in Glasgow now. Um, and what he used to do was he used to have big bushy hair and a kind of droopy moustache and very deep set eyes. And he always used to wear a long brown Mac and carry a little plastic bag. And he used to walk out and he would stand still in silence for about two minutes looking really weird. And then he would say, a lot of people say to me, get out of my garden. Now, as far as I'm concerned, that is the greatest opening line ever. <laughs> and not just to a comedy set, to anything. I don't think there's a book or a play or a film that couldn't be improved by having that as it... The book of Genesis would make a lot more sense if it just... <laughs> if it began like that and cut to the chase, you know. And it always used to get a really good laugh, that joke. But it got a much bigger laugh in 1995 when Joe Pasquale did it as one of his jokes in his Royal Variety performance set of that year. And there's always been a kind of tradition of mainstream acts kind of borrowing our material. In fact, uh, you might remember at the end of 2004, uh, Jimmy Carr had to take Jim Davidson to task for stealing some of his material. Although, to be honest, if Jim Davidson can steal your material, maybe it's time to think about writing something else. <laughs> Although, to be fair to Jimmy Carr, right, it was a kind of sexist bit that he'd written uh, with a sense of irony that Jim Davidson was able to appropriate at face value. <laughs> One of the kindest things you can say about Jim Davidson as a fellow comic is he's not a performer who is troubled by the possibility of duality of meaning. Right? <laughs> so I did this piece for a Sunday newspaper in 95 about this idea of material theft. And I rang up Joe Pasquale and I said to him, how did you think of that joke about the garden? And Joe Pasquale said, he said, I thought if someone looked out of their window and they saw me in their garden, they would say, get out of my garden. <laughs> now that's not quite right, is it? Because if you looked out of your window and you saw Joe Pasquale in your garden, <laughs> You just go, who's that? <laughs> Joe Pasquale. <laughs> In the garden. <laughs> what can he possibly want? Because that joke only really works if an anonymous weirdo is saying it. As soon as you introduce a celebrity into it, it's structurally compromised. Um, well, it is, isn't it? You know. So I said to him, are you sure you wrote that joke? I think it's one of Michael Redmond's jokes. And he said he couldn't remember if he'd written it. And it is difficult to remember sometimes if you've had an idea, especially when they occur as thick and fast as they must do in the mind of Joe Pasquale. <laughs> on an almost biannual basis. <laughs> and then he said he thought one of his writers might have written it, and it turned out what he meant by writers was not so much people that wrote for him as people that went around writing things down that other comedians had said. <laughs> but there's a kind of belief amongst the kind of mainstream acts. They say it's not possible to copyright a joke. They say you can't own a joke. So, bearing that in mind, I've tried to write a joke that Joe Pasquale won't be able to steal, right? <laughs> and it goes like this. Joe Pasquale goes into a bar. <laughs> he says to the barman, I'd like a pint of beer, please. And the barman says, why don't you just come around the bar, help yourself to the beer, and then walk off without paying for it? After all, you are Joe Pasquale. 
or perhaps sending someone else to steal the beer for you. <laughs> and then deny that beer can actually be owned. <laughs> Say that you find the very concept of the ownership of beer hard to understand. <laughs> or better still, insist that it is your beer and that you brewed it at home, in your house. <laughs> Even though your home lacks the most rudimentary of brewing facilities. <laughs> Thank you very much indeed.